agriculture was in some ways a devil's bargain. Uh, we, we began by domesticating wheat, and that's the way we always talk about it, but the fact is that we domesticated us in some ways, and we gave up the freedom to wander and hunt and gather as we had done for 50,000 years. Um, that may be better or worse than what, um, agriculture in some ways, and we can argue that as a value judgment, but the fact is evolution made us to be that way. And we surrendered um, the, the conditions that, that we evolved under. People still argue a lot about how agriculture happened. The, the classic story is that we ran out of game, essentially. We became overpopulated. There were too many people, and so it was the only way to feed ourselves. So one day, one guy woke up and said, I think I'll invent agriculture. That's not the way it happened, probably, but that's one story. Another is that we just did disturbances by um, living together, the disturbance in the soil of people compacting the soil, walking around villages, that sort of thing, allowed weeds to grow, and we started eating those weeds, which is grass, essentially. Uh, but it happened, and it happened in five different places on the planet, at least uh, independently. So in some ways, it was inevitable because it happened independently in so many ways. But once that happened, then people started um, raising grain and became highly dependent on that grain and highly dependent on city living. And pretty soon we were domesticated just like our livestock in some ways. Domestication occurred in five different places on the planet and each of those had a different crop. It was the basis of it. In the Middle East, it was wheat. Um, and we domesticated wheat from a wild grass that grew there, a predecessor in uh, just in an area that's now Iraq, oddly enough. Um, in Asia, there were two separate domestications of rice and rice became the foundation and really the analog for wheat. It served exactly as wheat did in, in the Middle East, but same deal. There was a separate domestication of rice in Africa that we know about. In the New World, in, in uh, North America and South America, corn and squash and beans were domesticated in North America. In South America, it was tubers, potatoes, essentially. So those are the mainline crops and still the mainline crops today. Those four or five crops account for something like 73% of human nutrition today. The effect of um, agriculture on people was very much like domestication in other animals. Um, we started moving a lot less uh, because we were sedentary. We lived in cities. Um, we were able to store grain, and because we could store grain, that was wealth. Because there was wealth, there was poverty. Uh, there was hierarchy. There were leaders. There were people who were in control, which we had never experienced before. There were institutions like churches and government, which never existed before. And those things served to organize society and regiment society in ways that we could continue to produce our food. The main thrust of agriculture and the environment um, was there from the very beginning. We tend to think of agriculture today as industrial ag agriculture, and somehow that's different than what we've been doing for six or eight or 10,000 years. But in fact, the principle is exactly the same. We're not doing all that much that's different. The plants we do eat are biological freaks. They're annual grasses, which are very rare in nature. Um, nature prefers perennials. And because they're annuals, they're there for a special purpose. They're there to colonize areas after a fire, after a flood, after a real disaster has occurred. Uh, something that resets the biological clock to zero. So they're the colonizers. Um, so what we do when we do agriculture is mimic that disaster. We create disaster. And that disaster is what allows those annuals to grow. So we plow the soil every year and reduce the biological clock again to zero. And it requires energy and fertilizer and a number of other things to sustain that disaster year after year. That's farming. The change we call industrial agriculture really occurred beginning in about 1940, 1930, and there someplace. It began in the United States. And there was almost an intensification, it was, not more than almost, it was a serious intensification of what had gone on before. But a number of, of things made it possible. The biggest of those is very simple, it's called short plants. And breeders were able to make wheat especially, but also rice, to grow much shorter so it would invest more of its energy into its seed head. At the same time, it would sustain heavy doses of chemical fertilizers. 
Those two things together caused what really we're calling, what we call the Green Revolution around the rest of the world. And that's what it was. It was a Green Revolution. It very much wasn't a revolution in agriculture. But we can read that revolution by what it required, which was a, a very rapid intensification of use of chemical fertilizers and of pesticides. Both of those things, and also irrigation water. Those three things came together to really uh, very much intensify the impact of, of agriculture on the environment. One of the results of the Green Revolution also was economy of scale, and so it became much more efficient to grow on large scale. Small farms went away. And so where typically a farm in the Midwest would be a couple hundred acres here in Montana, 500, 600, uh, that's more than doubled now. So a typical wheat farm here in Montana is about 3,000 acres. Um, 3,000 acres generally employs one person. One person is able to take that 3,000 acres and raise a crop of wheat from it. So the other, it, the other thing that happened with the Green Revolution was fewer people live on the farms, live on land. Um, it depopulated the landscape and created a series of very large farms. Those are the independent farms. The large corporate farms go to tens, and, tens of thousands of acres, hundreds of thousands of acres. Profitability of farming is a really interesting question. <laughs> and it, it's, it, it, people who long for free markets in the United States would be good to start with farming. And that's the only place where we really don't have anything that looks like a free market. So most of farming's income in the United States is based on the subsidy system, and it has been since World War II. Um, it was designed with the best of intentions by a very progressive government that wanted to make uh, farming less, uh, less ha financially hard on the people who did it. But the subsidy system has grown to the point now that corporations take advantage of it and, and live off that subsidy more than anything else. We can't say how profitable farming the land is. We can say how profitable farming the government is. And here in Montana, for instance, to use one example, one county was profiled, an entire county of farmers, and, I, and every farmer except three were accepting subsidies. And the average subsidy payment per farmer was $30,000 a year. That's the profit of the farm. Politically, the agriculture industry has a very interesting problem, especially with declining number of people on the land. So if we're saying farmers are now about 1% of the American population, then how can they be politically significant at only 1%? Well, the answer to that is the lobby is very good at multiplying a couple of effects. One of those is kind of the warm spot in our heart we have for farmers. There's a great yeoman myth that it's at the foundation of our country is that farmers are good people. Well, some of them are really good people. That's, I'm not disputing that at all. But that, that plays out for a lot. But what also works, and, and worked even more so in years past, is that agriculture is big business, and it's not just about farmers. It's about the fertilizer salesmen. It's about the processors. It's about the food industry. It's about making tractors. All those things come together in a much, much larger business. And it's in alliance with those other businesses that farmers multiply their power and become very powerful. Now, if you notice, all of that has to do with the industrial side of agriculture. So those farmers who are trying to escape the industrial system don't have that political clout because they don't have those industrial allies, and it's a very different system. It's why the industrial ag system has a momentum of its own. The, the issue of political power with farming has a lot to do with the public's knowledge of, of what goes on in the system itself. And the public's knowledge of, of the raw politics of farming is pretty scant. And people really don't understand exactly how their food is produced. If they did, they would be outraged more than they already are. What they do understand is quality of your food. And so during the last 10, 15 years, especially since I've been covering this issue and thinking about this issue, there's been almost a groundswell of public awareness about the quality of food. That's really a good thing. It's a selfish thing in some ways, but that's fine because people begin their awareness by what they eat every day. And at some point they understand that the, 
the industrial agriculture food they're buying at the supermarket is harming them, and it's not very good. It's not very pleasant to eat, and food is supposed to be pleasure. And so by understanding that and beginning the process there and understanding our health and how our health is affected by our food, and what, what's more important to our health than our food? By understanding those things, people are becoming aware and attaching to these other issues and demanding something better from the agricultural system. I used to talk about change in the agriculture movement 10 or 15 years ago as, as a hypothetical, like this could happen. And things I would talk about were things like farmer's markets in every town or grass-finished beef available in the supermarket. 10 years ago, and that's not very long ago, those things were a dream. And the industrial ag people were saying, no, the American consumer will never accept this. Well, the American consumer has. And every one of us knows today that we can go to a farmer's market in our town. It happens almost, it happens in big cities like New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles. It happens in little towns like Helena, Montana. We have farmer's markets. That's a really healthy step. Um, there are many networks bringing up a, a farm to consumer direct marketing going on. So I can buy a half of beef here in Helena, Montana, knowing the rancher. I go shake his hand and he shows me how that animal was raised and he shows me the exact uh, conditions of, of that created that meat. That's really important to me. But that's possible, that wasn't possible 10 years ago. Industrial agriculture, of course, have taken notice of the changes that have happened in 10 years and, and the biggest response has been to, to attempt to co-opt it. So we, we see all sorts of green labeling and green marketing going on is saying, well, this is a natural product and so forth and stretching the bounds of, of your imagination of the word natural. But nonetheless, um, that is a, a, a backhanded compliment in some ways. It's the industry recognizing there's a real power there for change. And they attempt to tap into it by showing some profit out of the deal. But it's pretty easy to expose that stuff at the same time and say, no, here's the, here's the real deal over here. This is where you ought to be going. And so um, th th that strategy is pretty easy to defeat. Um, but behind the scenes, industrial agriculture at the same time still lobbies for the subsidy system, still tries to preserve the status quo, still argues that we have to raise wheat, and still addicts us all to sugar. And in the end, that's, that's the powerful force, the addictive powers of sugar. When people read my book, I hope they understand the complexity of, of the problem. And that is, we are almost evolved to be um, uh, absolutist about food and understand food in a very narrow perspective. I don't like this, I like this. And uh, food fetishes abound. Um, we are fetishistic about food. Um, I hope that's not what they do. I hope people respond and say, okay, this is interesting, but still, at the same time, understand the broader implications, but also understand that food is wrapped up in our humanity and who we are. It's how we, it's how we commune with each other in many ways. And I hate to see people give that up and to be so moralistic about food that they, they fail to understand that this is how we come together. And, and this is how we enjoy life with food. And with a few minor adjustments, we can enjoy life again with our food.